When a possessed pair of jeans begins to kill the staff of a trendy clothing store, it is up to Libby, an idealistic an idealistic young sales clerk, to stop its bloody rampage. That film is Slacks. It's kind of like a hilarious and grisly mix-up between maybe Scream and The Devil Wears Prada with a, a little bit of Gremlins thrown in. And it releases on Video On Demand, Digital HD, and DVD on September 7th. Welcome to the Scare Guy Show. We are coming to you straight from the spooky heart of Hollywood, California. Um, we are the official podcast of thescareguy.com, where we as filmmakers discuss horror films, haunt events, spooky news, and anything that is scary fun. Please follow us on, on that hashtag show, YouTube, Spotify, and wherever you listen to podcasts. My name is Jim Fry. I am the editor-in-chief and one of your horror hosts today. Also with me today is Carrie. What's up? Excited to talk about some killer pants. <laughs> and it was great. Today, our special guest, we are so thankful to have her here today. We are speaking with the co-producer and co-writer of Slacks, Patricia Gomez. Z oh, I knew I was going to mess it up. Z Zlatar. Zlatar. Can you please pronounce your last name for us? Zlatar. It's I, a hard I, one. It's a hard one. I get it. I, I don't think anyone really pronounces it properly. <laughs> don't worry about it. But I wanted to so bad. I really wanted to. I to, Just to show that uh, I know what I'm doing. But Patricia, welcome to the Scare Guy Show. Thank you for being with Ooh, us today. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And we are so excited to talk about this very unusual film that we just saw. But first of all, could you introduce yourselves a little bit to the audience and tell everybody kind of like what was your, your journey in filmmaking been like so far? I mean... It took me a while to get into filmmaking. So, I mean, I'm from Chile and uh, I moved to Canada. And I guess I grew up always thinking I'd be, uh, you know, a scientist, something very sensible. So for a huge chunk of my life, I was a scientist. In my 20s, I call it my other life. Um, I was a scientist until I realized I was unhappy being a scientist and I wanted to be a filmmaker. So it, it kind of took me about 30 years to figure that one out. It wasn't... Uh, a clear path. I wish I could say I always wanted to be a filmmaker. I think deep down I did. I just, I don't know, like a lot of immigrant kids, I guess you don't want to let down your parents. They've worked so hard to get you out of the country and you, you just want to, you know, make them proud. But it, it took me a while to finally realize I wanted to make films. So at the young tender age of 30, <laughs> I, I made the career <laughs> switch from scientist uh, to filmmaker. And then I haven't looked back. I've just tried my best to to make films that I want to make, which tend to be horror films because I'm a horror geek. So it's what I want to do. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Hey, can you just tell us, name us three of your uh, favorite horror films. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'd have to say definitely Evil Dead. I can watch that on repeat all day long, cooking, doing laundry. It's just, it's, just, it's like a comfort, you know, it's like mm -hmm. comforting to have in the background. Um, John Carpenter's a thing, still one of my favorite films. It just blew me away in terms of the story, in terms of the, uh, like the special effects are just amazing. And I just loved how it ended so dark, you know, such a dark, dark ending. It just mm -hmm. made such an impression on me. And I think the third one would be Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Just the rawness of it. It's yeah. just, I had never felt that kind of energy from a film where it was like exhilarating, but absolutely frightening and horrible at the same time. Um, so those would be my three films. I'm like totally a child <laughs> of the 80s. I grew up on that stuff. So yeah, those would be my three that I watch pretty consistently, I think. Great. Carrie. <laughs> nice. Yeah, you, you've mentioned a couple points that I can see those influences for your film of semi-darker ending-ish, but we'll get to that. And then the, you know, just having that 80s, even though the film, it's set present day, it kind of has mm -hmm. some 80s fun horror vibes, the over-the-top gore, which is so fun. <laughs> uh, can you talk about the gore process of how you achieved that in the film and what was maybe the focus of, you know, let's make pants that are gory and bloody <laughs> and super destructive. I mean, we always wanted to have a lot of gore. When we were writing it, it was very clear what we wanted. Now, 
you know, when you write, you're just writing about a pair of pants. You don't actually think about what that's going to look like. And then when it came time to produce it, we were like, how are we going to do this? And luckily we were able to find a great puppeteer who puppeteered 45 puppets because it took 45 puppets to puppeteer a pair of pants, if you can believe it. Because what I learned is that you need a puppet for everything. So like the right leg goes up, that's one puppet. You know, this other leg goes up, it's another, you know. Um, and we were able to find a puppeteer and a special effects team that just gelled so well. And then our VFX people came in and made it look all a little seamless because sometimes it doesn't look so smooth in real life. So uh, it was just great that we were able to find the collaborators because the pants could have looked horrible. And because they were looking good, we were able to make them have more fun and do more things and make things more gory. So it was kind of like, how are we going to get these pants to, to be something that's not absolutely ridiculous and and they, and they worked and so we we just lucked out finding the right people but we had a great puppeteer and one of my favorite things about the shoot was seeing elza direct the the pair of pads because she has to direct the pair of pads <laughs> in this scene you're so sad or you're really bitter in this scene so you're just lashing out <laughs> those were my favorite parts <laughs> And then stay through to the credits, everybody watching. There's some yes. awesome behind the scenes footage of the yes. films and animation plus bloopers and a post post credit scene too. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was really clever. I got to ask you though, killer pants, where, where in the world did you guys come up with this idea? Because pitching, okay. Like I can imagine, you know, we're, we're both filmmakers as well. Like pitching the idea. I want to have, <laughs> I want to do a movie about a, a pair of jeans that kills people in a in a store. That's bizarre, but it's well, and, it and then good. I would like to add to that too. Of did there's also the film Rubber, so it's a killer tire. Yeah. So is that was that anything of like, hey, if they made that, we can make ours? I have to tell you, this is going to be embarrassing. Like we had this idea a long time ago, so it took a long time to make. I'm going to be honest. I wish I could say, oh, we whipped it out in four weeks and it's brilliant. No, no, no. Um, we, we got this idea. It was an inside joke. As you can imagine, it was a really long road trip. We were talking about words we hated. Slacks was one of them. Um, and we just started to repeat the word slacks, slacks, slacks. And then Elsa and I were like, oh my God, this is killer jeans. This is a slasher film. So we were super excited. The first draft was horrible. It was in a high school. It was super generic, popular girls, blah, 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 no message. And then we realized, oh, shoot, this has to be more about just killer pants. It's not enough to just ride the killer pant thing. It, it's good for 10 minutes and then you're bored. So we put it on the shelf for years, to be honest. We didn't know what to do with it. And then we picked it up again. And I had done a lot of retail uh, when I was younger. And so I said, let's put it in a store. And it just kind of came together so much better. And a lot of the, the stuff that I had to endure during my retail years is in slacks, all that like mumbo jumbo and the lingo and Craig, the manager is like an amalgamation of like a bunch of managers I used to have. And, and so it started to come together, but we were still missing an important element. And so we put it on the shelf for another couple of years because apparently this is what we do. And then Elsa saw this documentary on fast fashion and she's like, this is a missing piece. And it gelled like instantly overnight. We wrote that draft and like, a month and it was pretty much ready to shoot soon after so it was just about finding the missing pieces and we did do that draft in the beginning of just killer pads and it didn't work it, it was just not obviously it was just it's a fun pre premise but it wasn't really something to be sustained so once we put in the corporate element to it and the fast fashion it came together and then we were off like off and running like really it just came together really fast and it made sense finally it made sense hmm when you say fast fashion, is that, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Well, it's the idea of um, buying a t-shirt that's $5, wearing it for three months, throwing it away and buying another. It's, it's the oh. idea of buying fashion that you aren't intending to keep for long because it's such poor quality and it's made very cheaply. So it's like a cycle. Because let's be honest, who wants to buy an $80 t-shirt, right? We're, we're not even trained this way in North America to even you know think about it. So... But the idea of fast fashion is yes, it's it's done in such a cheap way that you have to keep consuming. So it's like this endless machine and you're still spending probably $80 over 10 years for these t-shirts, Whether whereas if you yep. bought the $80, $80 t-shirt to begin with, you might actually wear it for 10 years. So, so that's what fast fashion is. And it's the cost of 
you know, the people making the clothes, horrible conditions. But um, what we also want to talk about in, in the movie is that these corporations, we're also victims of these corporations. We're brainwashed. And as employees of these corporations, I mean, it was such a toxic work environment when I worked in, in retail. We're also their victims, you know. We're, they're, they're trying to brainwash everyone on so many different levels and all for profit. So I think that's kind of... Uh, where, where Slacks comes in and where, where as fashion and, and those slogans. I mean, Alza and I had so much fun making up those slogans because they're ridiculous. And so many stores have these slogans that you're just like, what does it even mean? Like, you don't really care, but that's what we <laughs> want you to think, right? So, uh, so yeah, that's, I think the fast fashion really kind of brought it together. And, and it also what brought the element of who the killer pants are. Because the killer pants are always just this entity and then as soon as you can make it into more of a character, I think it just it just made the film work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, I was going to say, so you, you've kind of touched upon it, but if you want to expand on how important was it to you to have a message with the film? Because often horror is a great avenue to have social commentary because it's done in a way that it's like, hey, look at this without being, you know, beating people over the head with it. So it's a way to address a topic in a, a more subtle and maybe not so subtle way. So how important was it to you to have these different messages? Because looking at the film, you, there's a lot of different subtext and meaning that you could pull from it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, very important to me and to Els as well. I mean, we didn't just want to make a film about killer pants and we did want to address this idea of these corporations. I think Els and I are very, as, as we're, as we're growing older, <laughs> we're thinking about things a little bit more. And it's this idea that these corporations, it's like they're killing people abroad, but they're killing us at home too. Like we're just becoming these consumer, we, we just consume and consume to what end. And so mm -hmm. I, I think it was very important to talk about that. And we wanted to have the different layers, but we also wanted to make sure it was still fun because I love going to see fun movies. I don't want to be preached at or anything like that. So it was, always a delicate balance and we hope that people have a great time watching slacks but maybe they go home and they think about it a week or two later mm -hmm. and they're like hmm okay and they start thinking about some of the more serious issues that we touch upon and like i said i think we're all in some ways victims of these corporations and we're all complicit and it's up to you to kind of figure out where you fall or how much longer you want to be complicit or you want to be brainwashed i mean and I'm saying this like I'm not like an expert and I still, you know, shop at some of these big brands. So I don't want you to think I'm holier than thou. It's not that. It's just the idea of like, let's think about it. Is there something mm -hmm. small I can do or something big? And everyone has whatever, the, like everyone knows what they can do. And even if it's something small, it's still, I think, helpful at this point. I think mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So it, it's very important for us, but it was also very important for us to make sure the film was fun because we want people to have a good time. It is about killer pants, right? So I can't be <laughs> serious. <laughs> well, can we talk a little bit about um, a couple of your characters in here and how they, mm -hmm. they kind of, and how they do tell the story a little bit. Like one, you have a couple of characters in particular, three in particular that just really stood out as very different, but um, we have your main character. Yes. Uh, Libby. Can you tell us a, yeah. We're kind of seeing this story through her eyes. Could you tell us a little bit about this character? Yeah, you know, actually this character to me is Elsa because Elsa was lucky enough to never work retail. So I would tell her these <laughs> stories and she would be horrified. And I'm like, you're so innocent. So she's kind of our in. So if you've never done retail, she's she's like Elsa, right? So you go in thinking the world is one thing and then you see the dark side of it or the dark heart of it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, she she was a natural main character for to really introduce people into the world. And then the manager... Yeah, he's, yeah. he's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> he he seemed kind of like uh, heartless a little bit there, though. Heartless, but I'm, I hope as well at some point you kind of feel sad for, for Craig because yeah. he's also a victim of this big corporate machine. And again, he's really an amalgamation of a lot of my managers, a little bit of here and there. So obviously he's like the extreme manager version of, of people, but... I mean, there was always something a little bit sad about my managers in the mm -hmm. store I worked at because they, it's not that they were bad people, but they were just, 
they were just forced into being, I don't know, these, these drones or something. And I always felt kind of sad and sorry for my managers. And I think for Elsa and I, it was important to get that across from Craig. It's almost like Craig is not a bad guy. He just had a very bad day and made really horrible choices. <laughs> he didn't inherently, he's not inherently a bad guy. He's just kind right. of manipulated and he's manipulated himself. And I always felt for these managers, and maybe I'm wrong because I was looking at it through like a 20 year old eyes, but I always felt that they, I'm, I'm always like, can't you do more than just be a manager? Like I always, I always felt like, mm -hmm. how do they feel? They must not have any options if there's just being a manager at Gap or, or whatever. And, and so we wanted to get that sense for Craig. So yes, he's very heartless, but I hope you also feel kind of sorry for him because yeah, yeah. I mean, this and, is it. This is his life is the CCC and that's it. It's kind of sad. So I hope I hope that came across. It did. It, and one more character that I know that you had a lot of fun with. She this she was just <laughs> <laughs> tell us about your influencer. OK, can I be honest? I didn't even know what an influencer was until <laughs> Elsa was like, oh, my God, you have to check this channel. And I looked at it and I'm like, what am I seeing? And then the whole <laughs> world opened up and I was like, I, I didn't know they existed. Okay. I'm like, so not a fashion person. So I was like, what? And as soon as we realized these people exist and they're popular and oh my goodness, mm -hmm. I mean, they had to be in the, in the, in the film and we had to make sure that she died a very great death because death to all those influencers. Right. <laughs> well, I, you gave it away, but here's our, you can see right here a little bit of a, 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 yeah, a little a, snippet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, all right, Carrie. Uh, yeah. I, and also, if you if you want to expand at all, because I uh, before we started, I was telling Jim, I'm like, I didn't work in retail. Uh, I worked at a video store and movie theater, but like selling stuff, I was like, wow, are people really like this? I mean, we had our own like push the sale, push the sale. But this was like intense. And you, if you want to expand, cause you already said, yes, it's by real things. But what? This is really the environment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would start my day where they were like. Last year, we made this much money. So this year, we need to make 10% more, which is this much, like literally a number. Mm. And they were like, so that means every hour we need to make, they would have the whole day based on how much money they have to make. And then the whole day, your manager's on you being like, oh, we're behind on our goal. We're behind on our goal. And so it was very toxic. When I look back, I mean, goodness gracious. And that's how they saw customers, just like dollar signs. And the employees are stressed because the managers are like, sell more, sell more, stock promotion this and that promotion that. And so sadly, Carrie, that's that was what it was like for retail. And we would have these changeovers at night. That's totally real. I used to do that all the time. I would I would stay over overnight in the store, change everything. And it was always like a race against time and hurry up and you're not going fast enough because an invariably you're understaffed because they don't want to pay enough people like so it's just sadly all that is is true the brainwashing the like let's get together we have a new product everyone needs to be happy that almost like crazy cult cult thing with Harold I mean sadly that that stuff happens and it's it's crazy so yes yeah. it's I wish I could say I made it up, but no, it's it's all it's all real. <laughs> well, me and Carrie, that's what we were talking about before the show was like this idea of a cult like figure who kind of leads the organization. And you're saying that kind of exists, right? Yeah. And you know, for the reference for the store and a lot of the posters and for that scene in particular, I mean, we had a great graphic artist. And the references that Els and I were giving him were like communist propaganda, Nazi propaganda. And so the story is actually set up with that in mind. Wow. And that that um, scene with Harold is supposed to be like a rally, you know, mm -hmm. an SS rally where everyone's like on board and they're just thinking it's the best thing. And it's this guy yeah. is like larger than life. So, yeah, it's it's supposed to have those dark undertones because we do feel that corporations uh totally use that same kind of promotional warfare on our minds and 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 there you have it so that's actually a very should be a very scary or odd scene because it's it's about brainwashing which i yeah, think all even, corporations do yeah you don't think about it too i don't think we notice our surroundings as much like the way you're describing it propaganda i mean you just think of it as an advertisement but right. I, it's a psyops mission these people know exactly what they're oh. doing 
Oh, they do. They do 100%. And now with the slogans of inclusion and this and green. And, and I mean, let's be honest. Do they really think that? No, it's just now they have to be this way to sell mm -hmm. more clothes and to be responsible. But yeah, I don't buy it, you know. Now, I also really love the characters that were essentially not fitting the mold. Uh, we have the essentially stoner guy, too, which I thought was really funny. Of He's just probably there to make some extra money. Yeah. Uh, and then we also have uh, Shruti, right? Yes, yes. And, and it's funny, Shruti is kind of like my doppelganger. I, I feel like I stayed in retail too long. So I was also that person like, why are you still here? I don't know, I'm still here, <laughs> folding clothes. Um, yeah. And near the end, I was a little bit like Shruti where I just hated everyone and I was just grouchy and it was time for me to leave. So, <laughs> I mean, I love Shruti. She was kind of me, always not wearing what I was supposed to be wearing and giving attitude to the, to the managers. Um, in my defense, I was in my 20s, so I was a little bit immature, but it's <laughs> but yeah, Shudi's definitely my doppelganger in, in the film. So yeah, I have a very fond spot for her. Remind me which character this is we're talking about. Shudi? Yeah. Yes. Uh, the, um, the, the, the one from India. Oh, you know, here we one, go. Yeah, that's yeah. her. You know, the one that wears like the toques and, and all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, I got to tell you, mm -hmm. she was one of my favorite characters here. I don't want to give away any endings, but like, I, I, let's just say I was really pulling for her. She was, uh, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. You're supposed to. I feel like you start out being like, who is this girl? And then, yeah. And then but you can can we, and, and we, and we, Carrie and I were talking about this before the show. She was able to give some context, a little bit of what, like, an Indian cultural context to, yeah. to, to the, the movie that it was so interesting. Did, can you talk a little bit about that? Did you have somebody that was able to, like a, a, a cultural representative or somebody that helped to make sure that you wove those themes in there? No, we didn't. But because I'm an immigrant, I felt mm -hmm. that was something I wanted to tackle. And you know what was so it was so great is that we have a very diverse cast, and that was done on purpose because we we live in Montreal, Elsa and I, um, and so it's very ethnic, it's very multicultural, and so we wanted to make sure it represented the society that we live in, and we wanted to have a person of color be one of the main characters, which we don't mm -hmm. see, and. Um, I mean, Shruti was great. And it's so funny when the actress came in for her audition. I mean, it's not funny. It's 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 crazy to think. She was like, oh, you don't want me to do an Indian accent. I can just speak normally. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're just a Canadian. It's she was shocked. She goes, nobody when I'm when I'm called in, it's to be an Indian from India. And I was it was almost heartbreaking when she told me that. I was like, you're mm -hmm. kidding. And it goes to show you she like she never gets offered just like kind of like a regular. Mm -hmm. a regular role she's like oh so i can speak like i usually do we're like yeah yeah yeah. no no accent just speak your english because she was born and raised in canada you know so <laughs> um so it's crazy to think that um i mean she was so glad to be able to do the role to have that opportunity but it, it was also very eye-opening for me that that she just doesn't get the opportunity sadly you know, or she gets certain kind of opportunities only. So, but she was mm -hmm. great. And, we, and you kind of commented on that in the film, which was really kind of cool. Yeah, 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 for sure. And, and we wanted to do a little bit of that, but again, not too much, because we don't want to be right. preaching and being like, blah, 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 because nobody wants to hear. I don't even want to hear that, you know? Um, so it's always like a little thing here, a little thing there, you know, um, mm -hmm. and that's it. And because Libby's like, you know, she's young, naive, you know, it, it just felt like that was a good way for her. Like she wants to be friendly, but doesn't know how. And yeah, that joke you know. when they're talking about the song was so spot on and funny. And yeah, I, I like Bollywood movies a lot. And I've, I've, I mean, I didn't have that kind of a conversation, but definitely mm -hmm. have encountered how just because someone's of whatever culture does not mean they watch the movies from yes. there. <laughs> and so I thought oh, yeah. it was really like, yeah, <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> poor Livy. You're just, she means well. And then, but then it was saved well. Like, all right, yeah, I know that song. But, um, yeah, yeah, of course. Cause at the same time, you know, Shruti's a little bit, you know, she's a badass and she's just trying <laughs> to like needle Livy too. It makes, it's fun for her too. So, yeah. but yeah, she was a great character. And, and she, mm -hmm. I mean, every, can I say the casting was so well? Like, everyone was just so game to just go for it. Because when you're casting Killer Pants, you're like, who's going to show up? Is, like, <laughs> is anyone going to, and then 
all these great actors showed up and they're so into it, like mm -hmm. so into it. It's just incredible. And like, if, if they got killed, they were even more into it because it's very messy and it's, you know, yeah. really uncomfortable for the actors, but everyone was so game and they were just really to just let it all hang out, which is great. I can't say there was a single cast member that was like holding back or unsure. Like everyone was there to make a killer pap film. So and just Elsa so and people, I left out. <laughs> and so people, just so people know, so you're prepared. This is not, it's killer pants, but mm -hmm. the, the gore is there. There are dismemberments. There's guts. There's blood aplenty. So be prepared for killer plants and killer plants, killer pants, and a lot of blood. Hey, Car Carrie, we are coming up to the end of our interview here. What? Um, let's go ahead and see if we can close out with a couple of good questions. Yeah. Well, Patricia, obviously this one's a definite fun film. What's next for you? Mm -hmm. Oh goodness. I mean, Elsa and I, we have a couple of projects we're working on. We have a vampire uh, TV series we're working on and a poltergeist script based on my time in grad school. <laughs> wait, 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 what, did, wait. what does that mean? <laughs> well, I was very unhappy in grad school. I didn't know why. Maybe it's because I was doing something I didn't love. But at the time, I was like, must be everything else, not me. Oh, wow. And so it's this idea of this woman being so angry that she creates a killer poltergeist <laughs> to do her bidding. And then obviously she loses control of it because it has to be entertaining. So we're working on that. I also have some other projects with, with other people. And then I sometimes I just produce other people's projects, so stuff mm -hmm. I don't write. So I have a, a couple of great projects that... Um, I'm hoping to get onto the screen soon. So just always trying to hustle, keep keep it going, but always horror, because that's that's my thing. I love horror. I like read horror, I listen to creepy music, and I watch horror. So that's awesome. That's nice. Do some killer high heels next. That would be, <laughs> yeah. be awesome. That'll be I the have sequel. to say, just me walking in high heels would be like the horror <laughs> because I never wear high heels. I would like twist my ankle like <laughs> That horror film dunch. <laughs> well, Slats comes out on September 7th on Video On Demand, Digital HD and DVD. And if you guys get a chance to look at the extras on the DVD, the story behind Slats, there's a, a making of producing a killer pants movie. The pants are alive. Call in the death consultant casting Slats in a really cool behind the scenes photo documentary. Patricia, thank you so much for being with us today. Where can people follow you or find out more about what's going on with your career? Well, by the way, thank you. I've had so much fun today. You you guys are the best. I'm like, too bad you're like across the, you know, so far away. Um, uh, basically, I have a production company called Head on the Door Productions. So you can check out what I'm up to there. It has all my projects, stuff in development and stuff that I've produced Um that's probably the best way. I would say check me out on Facebook, but I'm going to be honest. I'm like the worst at social media. I know. I know that's 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 a big two thumbs down for me, but I just feel like I never have time for that. I don't know. So probably my website. I'm old school. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> you're, you're busy working. You're busy working. All right. Carrie. Yes. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Patricia. Uh, Y'all can find me, here we go, on the, all, all the social media websites at Carrie D. Lane. That's K-A-R-I-D-L-A-N-E. And everybody, thank you for tuning in today. Make sure you check out Slacks. It, it is bloody good fun. You guys are going to love it. Also, you can follow me at James D. Fry on Instagram or just follow us on thescareguy.com. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>